we're pretty passionate about uh, the, the community and, and education and, and providing information. So we wanted to take this opportunity to provide a, uh, something, you know, some information about something that's been really top of mind and something that we're really passionate about. And uh, it's uh, something that we see in the news all the time. Uh, and it's something that's important. We, we, we see the, we're on the front lines, essentially. We see how it impacts businesses, corporate or organizations uh, across the board. And uh, just uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, I had somebody call me that uh, a smaller medical practice that had been in business for 23 years and lost 23 years of financial and patient information uh, due to not having some of these, uh, the right things in place to protect themselves. And uh, with this, because of this and other examples and other things that we deal with, we want to make sure that the community is informed so you can make good decisions uh, on how to protect your information and your data. So today, what we did is we, uh, we have a partner that we work with really closely called Datto, and, and he'll be talking to us here shortly. He's an expert in the field uh, around security and business continuity. And we've worked with them for four years. They've been a really close partner with us, and it's been phenomenal. Uh, we love the technology, and we love being able to uh, sleep at night <laughs> because you know, the, the, the clients that we support, their data, their infrastructure is protected. And um, Eric comes from Milwaukee, so give him a hard time. <laughs> you know, not quite a Tricidian, but uh, you know, the Packers, the Bucks, uh, not, not, so, not so sure about that. Brewers, Brewers. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Um, so uh, what's interesting about Datto is, is within, uh, it got started, typical story, and Eric will tell a little bit more about that. Typical story though, and I'll, I'll a little bit of a spoiler, Started out in a basement, and eight years later, it was a billion dollar company. Crazy. But that's how much in, in demand and how fundamental the technology is. So uh, with that said, and thank you, Eric, for coming. Go ahead, Eric. You, uh, I'll let you lead the show and, and uh, start with the uh, presentation. Thank you all for changing your morning routines and uh, joining us today. I know what it's like sitting on that side and how boring and dry somebody like me can be. So uh, I promise to keep it a little bit entertaining and, and provide some value for you all this morning. Uh, as Byron mentioned, I'm Eric Torres, Channel Development Manager with Datto. Um, my role at Datto is, is quite fun. I'm one of the company's evangelists. I get to travel all over the world and, and meet folks like yourselves and find out what's working, what's not working, and then bottle all of that up and, and share it with the, with the masses. Um, been with the company for about three years now, but prior to that, I spent 10 years working for a company uh, just like Technologize. So I know what it's like uh, grinding it out and, and uncovering these, these issues that do attack networks and then resolving those issues and, and providing support in times when, when our clients are in need. Um, as Byron mentioned, uh, we, have, we were founded in 2007. Um, this is our 10 year anniversary, which is pretty exciting. Our CEO, Austin McCord, founded it in his parents' basement, uh, fresh out of school. And the story is pretty fascinating. He was actually a, a C student. He wasn't even that good at, at school. And, uh, and he couldn't find a job out of college. So he sought out to create his own job. And um, bootstrapped the company in his parents' basement, took out $80,000 in loans. And since then, we've grown the company to over 900 employees worldwide. Uh, we're headquartered in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, offices in Boston, Rochester, Toronto, Sydney, London. I had the, uh, the luxury and the privilege of, of going out to Singapore to help op open our, our office out there. So it's awfully exciting. Um, before I joined the company at the, the MSP that I was with, I was also a Datto partner. 
So I I knew what it was like um, going out there and doing that, and then now joining the the vendor side, the dark world, and and now positioning f it for our our great partners like Technologize. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that we are 100% channel only, meaning we do not sell direct. Uh, you cannot purchase it from us directly because we're not the experts in, in maintaining networks. Technologize is. They're the ones that, that build it, design it, maintain those networks. They're the pros at doing that. We're simply just a, the business continuity tool that they use to protect your networks and your data in the event that something does happen. Uh, we do have nine data centers around the world. I do want to be clear that none of the data that's in the U.S. leaves U.S. soil. Uh, we have a data center on the East Coast, and then everything from that data center gets replicated to the West Coast. So in, in our minds, if something happens to the East Coast, we have your data safe. It's living somewhere else. If something happens to both coasts, we're in a world of hurt, and I'm guessing your data is probably the, the least of all of our worries. Um, and when I say on the coast, it's not actually on the coast. It's Reading, Pennsylvania, and Salt Lake City. So it's not like a, a natural disaster, a hurricane or something could, could come on in. Um, speaking of hurricanes and natural disasters, that's first and foremost what people think about when they're thinking about business continuity. And, um, and we, we, are, we keep that in mind when it comes to that. But that, that's not the only thing that brings down networks. However, in, in the past few weeks, we've seen some incredible uh, natural disaster stories out there that we stay in front of. Uh, this is actually uh, our war room back at our headquarters in Norwalk. We actually monitor weather systems. And we have somebody sit there 24-7 and just look at what's happening around the world so that we can stay in front of something if there is a natural disaster so that we can call our partners like Technologize and say, hey, there's something heading your way. We've got a team here waiting for you if you have any clients that do go down. And that's exactly what we did when we saw this uh, Hurricane Harvey forming in the Gulf Coast. Except this time we did something a little bit different, which um, makes me really proud to, to work for Datto. Um, as we saw this building, we, or this, this building in the Gulf, we knew this was going to be disastrous, and we knew it was going to be bad. So what we did different than what we've done in years past is Austin, our, our CEO, um, he decided to send a team down to Houston ahead of the storm. And we packed a, a truck full of our equipment, full of some of our best engineers, and just said, start driving to Texas. We're going to call you on the way, and we're going to tell you where you're going to go, where you're going to stay, and what you're going to do. But we needed boots on the ground so that we could get networks back up and running like that, because that's what it's all about, is getting your network back up and running in the event of any kind of disaster. We didn't know how bad it was going to be. Um, we woke up in the morning and, and saw the pictures like this. Um, literally highways under eight feet of water, which is absolutely disastrous. Um, one thing that, that I didn't mention is the truck that we sent full of that equipment was absolutely free. We knew people were in a world of hurt, and we're not in the business to profit on somebody else's misery. So we gave it to them for free, let them get back up and running, protect your data, let's worry about that in the background after everybody's up and running. Once we saw this, everybody at the company was just like, holy crap, Austin is, he, he's not just in this as a money grab, he's really out here to, to help our, our partners and our clients and you all in the event of a disaster. Um, and I do know that we do have some disasters up here. Obviously, it's not going to be uh, hurricanes, um, but we do have wildfires. Uh, we are watching what's happening right now in Napa and, and Sonoma and, and the devastation that's happening there. I'm actually heading there next week, um, not far from there, for just happened to be a, a presentation like this. But uh, I assume it's going to be a whole lot different once I get there and actually see what's going on there. Um, so. My role is, is to really get out here and start talking and, and informing people about rethinking backup because natural disasters are, are one thing and they're going to happen. And that's what people think about. It's, it's the fires, the floods, and the tornadoes. But in all actuality, the likelihood of this really happening, aside from this year, uh, it's really slim to none. In 10 years of being a managed service provider, I had one client that had a network go down because of a disaster. And that was because my engineer knocked off the sprinkler head in the server room and flooded the entire server room, which uh, thankfully at the time we did have a data solution in place and we were able to spin them back up, get them back up and running while I went there with my tail between my legs and said, I'm really sorry, I'll, I'm going to pay to rebuild your entire network. Um, but these types of things are, are unlikely to happen compared to the other stories that are out there. And there's one thing that happens to every single business, no matter how big, no matter how small, how much money you invest in your network, and that's people. 
people do terrible things to networks. I'm, I'm one of them. I do this for a living, and I'm always clicking on all the links in my emails, and I'm downloading all that freeware that I read about, and I'm, I need that, that half second a day. So I put that, that toolbar in my browser because that half second's valuable, right? Then I'm calling my IT department going, what's wrong with the network? How come it's so slow today? And they're just like, Eric, you idiot. Look at all the stuff you've installed on, on your laptop. That's why it's slow. What are you doing to our network? So it's people that are, are our greatest risk. And that's what we need to uh, be aware of. And the easiest way I can get this messaging across is to share some stories that, that I've picked up um, along the way. And, and some old, some new, but all of them still very relevant. Uh, this first one is um, about Alcoa. And this one's a little bit old. This is about three, three and a half years old. And Alcoa is a multi-billion dollar global uh, organization. And they got hacked. But what makes this story a little bit different is that um, the Wall Street Journal took notice of this. Alcoa essentially has an unlimited IT budget. They have the best that money can buy. And the Wall Street Journal said, how, did, how could somebody break into Alcoa? Like, that's, that's the best money can, can buy. So they sent some reporters to China, and, and they found these bad guys, which I think is fascinating for one. And they got to interview them. They said, how did you do it? How did you get past a million dollar security systems? How did you get through and, and steal that data? And they just laughed. They said, it's, it's actually really simple. All we did was we went to LinkedIn. We found out the naming convention of their email address, first initial, last name, at alcoa.com. And we sent an email to everybody in the company, because at least one employee will click on anything. This guy, I'm the one that's clicking on all that bad stuff. And, and that's how they, they got through. It's just as simple as that, a link in an email that somebody clicked on that got them right through that security. Uh, here's another one that's absolutely downright frightening to me. Um, our Pentagon got hacked um, coming up on two years ago now. And this story is a little bit different, if, if you guys remember this story. Um, what makes this one a little bit different is that these bad guys, this is the first time we saw these bad guys do their homework first. They didn't send an email to everybody at the Pentagon just hoping somebody would click on something. They only sent it to 16 people. And they did their homework. They figured out, they, they went to their Facebook accounts, their LinkedIn accounts, their Instagram accounts. They found out where they banked, found out where their kids went to school. And that's how they crafted the message to break into the Pentagon. Can Johnny come over to Sarah's house this weekend for a birthday party, click here for directions, and somebody clicked on it. And there's only 16 people this went to. One of the 16 gave them access by simply clicking on a link that they shouldn't have in their email. But this just shows the, the level and, and how far advanced these bad guys are getting when it comes to sneaking their code into a network to give them access to it. Um, they're doing their homework. They're thinking outside of the box. Now it's not just about blanketing somebody with a bunch of, of emails and links. It's about targeted attacks. Um, here's another one that, that happened uh, last summer, and this one's just gut-wrenching, too. Uh, this was the first hospital that got attacked by ransomware. In this case, that's the highest demand ever asked that the FBI reported, $3.6 million once these bad guys found out that it was a hospital that they attacked. And this ransomware shut down the entire hospital. No more medical records, no more T CT scans, no more x-ray equipment. Anything connected to that network did not work. So. And, and in this case, they did not have a business continuity plan. And again, somebody just clicked on the wrong link in an email. Since they didn't have a business continuity plan, they were scrambling. They didn't know what to do, literally shipping sick patients down the road to a different hospital. And in this case, they settled for $17,000 in Bitcoin, which that doesn't remove the ransomware. That just gives them the key to unlock it. So at any point, those bad guys could have turned it right back on until their IT department found that ransomware and removed it from the network. So this one is just, these guys have no morals. That's, that's the point of this one. They're willing to attack anybody and everybody they can in order to make their money. Back in the day, these, these bad guys were just some, some guy in their parents' basement on the futon just hacking to get more bragging rights than anything else. They would break into somewhere, and then they'd go on a chat forum, and they'd gain notoriety and say, hey, I broke into uh, Sony. I'm going to release a bunch of movies. And they did that over and over and over just for the notoriety. Then they figured out how to make money, and that's what made them incredibly dangerous. They started organizing and forming these criminal organizations to get their code out there faster, better, uh, more discreet, so they could start making more and more money. And that's what we need to prepare for. 
Um, so I have stories about ransomware that are actually from this year, from, from a matter of a few months, but not just ransomware, but the evolution of ransomware and how it changes even in that particular strain. Uh, this first one is one that tests our own morality. If anybody's seen this one, it's, um, it's actually uh, brilliant in, in my mind from a criminal standpoint. Popcorn time, has anybody heard of that? Um, that's one where it, or it gives the victims a choice. You can either pay the ransom or you can send this ransom to two of your friends, and if they pay it, we're gonna give you the data back for free. So it turns the victims into criminals themselves, and it tests our morality. And in this case, once it started working, and these bad guys, essentially what they did was they thought so far outside of the box that, why should I be the criminal myself? Why don't I just outsource my criminal ways and just watch that money come in? And that's what happened. And the next step in this one was they found out, they traced it, somebody sent the, the ransomware to their friend on the other side of the world. And so they, they didn't have, it was only in English. So the next step in this, they had to actually translate the ransom ask itself. So they're making it more and more user friendly. Within a month, they had a pop-up where you can translate the message into any language. That's the steps that this one took in a matter of a few short weeks. That's how good these guys are getting. Um, Everybody heard about WannaCry. Uh, that's, that hit in May. And WannaCry was, was the first of its kind for a different reason. WannaCry was the first that melded the, the old with, with the new. So the old was a worm. It traveled all throughout the world and just sat there dormant and figured out uh, devices to infect that were somehow connected. And it just waited for direction. On top of that worm was <coughs> ransomware. So in that one day, May, I forgot the exact day, but in May, they, the bad guys turned that ransomware on. And it infected, it was over, was it over <coughs> 150 countries, over 200,000 devices all at once, just like that. You couldn't pick up a newspaper, you couldn't read an article online without hearing about WannaCry. Now, the thing about WannaCry is, is that it wasn't even about the ransom itself at all. They only made $30,000 off of it. It was a little bit more than 30,000. So the FBI is like, okay, well, you infected that many networks, that many devices, and you only made 30 grand? Like, what's the whole point of it? And then after they dug into it, they realized that it wasn't even about the ransom. It was about the money sitting in their accounts. Their Bitcoin accounts are stacked with money. In this one day, the value of their accounts quadrupled in value just because of this. So it wasn't even about going out there and getting new money in. It's about quadrupling the money they already had. The beginning of this year, you could buy a Bitcoin for it was like just over $698. Does anybody know what it's at today? I didn't look it up today, but I looked it up two days ago. It was at $4,300. It's actually up over the past like two weeks. But $4,300 in a matter of, of 10 months, that's, that was one Bitcoin. These guys had just money sitting in an account, just quadrupling it and then cashing out. That's, that was the whole goal of WannaCry. Here's another one that, that's actually the first of its kind that, that I think is pretty brilliant too. Have you guys heard about the, the Big Mac Index? The Big Mac Index is the, the cost of a Big Mac in your town. And this is the first ransomware that changed the, the ransom ask depending on your location. First of its kind, based on the Big Mac Index, um, which is, is brilliant in its own right. So in this case, um, say for example, you live in Manhattan and you're used to paying six bucks for a Big Mac, I'm going to ask for more money for you if I infect your network because you're used to paying more for your goods. If you're from Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and you're used to paying $3 for a Big Mac, I'm going to ask less of you because I don't, I don't want you to sit back and go, whoa, that's too rich for my blood. I'm not paying that. So that's what's happening. That's how far outside the box these guys are thinking. That's how good they're getting. Um, in this case, the evolution of this, the very next week, it popped up on the dark web. Any one of us right now can go in and buy the Big Mac Ransom and start emailing it out ourselves. That's, that's the evolution of this. They created something that worked based on location, and then they started selling that on top of getting their ransom. So essentially, they had their own product. And what happens when you have a product? You have to support it. So the next step, the very next week, it popped up on, on a, a chat session. You can now chat with the people that wrote this ransomware and change it. If you're a bad guy, you could say, um, can you change that box to be red instead of blue? Because I think people will pay me faster. Or I need help setting up my Bitcoin account. Can you do that? I need to be more discreet. Can you help me do that? These guys will just chat with you live and say, yep, I got you. Don't worry. I'll send an update to that and, and you'll, you'll have whatever you need. 
That's the evolution. That's what we need to prepare for when we're talking about um, business continuity and, and backup solutions. It's, it's not so much the natural disasters. Yes, they're there and we have to prepare for them, but it is the ransomware that is going to infect our networks no matter how big and no matter how small. Uh, more often than not, when I'm, you know, for the past 10 years, when I'm sitting down with somebody, they, they say this, they, I have a great backup solution. I have my data in multiple spots and, and I'm, I'm good, I'm set. I don't need true business continuity. And I'll explain what that is in a second. That's exactly what San Francisco thought. Is anybody from San Francisco before I tell this story? Because I, I have been in a room where somebody was like, oh man, I'm from San Francisco, what are you doing to me? Um, San Francisco, the, the transit authority, uh, they got um, hit with ransomware la the end of last year. And in this case, it shut down all of their kiosks to buy tickets for their, their transit system. And they, they have a full-blown IT department, a brilliant IT department. They said, you know what? We're just going to restore from our backup solution. We have a great backup solution. We know our data is safe. It's living in a data center somewhere else. We'll just rebuild our network. As a result, the network was down for two days because they had a backup solution, not a business continuity solution. They had business continuity, meaning your network goes down, we literally flip a switch and bring it right back. Backup solution, your network goes down, we have to rebuild that network. We have to figure out what went down and then transfer all of your data and do it that way. That's the difference. But in this case, it wasn't just any two days, it was the Friday and Saturday after Thanksgiving. <laughs> the two most heavily traveled days for the, the San Francisco Transit Authority, they provide 735,000 rides a day in this case, they didn't shut down the train system. They just opened the gates and said, Happy Thanksgiving, everybody gets free rides. So you can see where I'm going with this. They normally charge between a dollar and two twenty-five per rider. So as a result, they lost up to three point three million dollars. That's just in ticket sales. That doesn't include the overtime to rebuild the network, the hardware to rebuild the network. Anything that had to do with rebuilding that network is on top of that, which I'm guessing had to be pretty expensive. So think about that when it comes to business continuity and backup solutions. Yes, they had a great backup solution. Their data was living somewhere else, but when they needed it, it took time to rebuild it, and they were down as a result. At Datto, we're always looking forward. Um, I, I was a Datto partner for five years. I've been with them for three years. So in the past seven years, I've seen the, the, the solutions that we offer change and evolve and get better and better. And what we announced last year was um, because we know that ransomware is, is running rampant and it's not going away. It's only going to get harder to detect. You could have the best security in place and sometimes something's going to get through. There's just no way we can 100% for certain say we're blocking all of the bad guys out. Something does get through. So we're doing something about it. Something that no other continuity provider is doing. And last year we introduced ransomware detection. And I want to be very clear, this is not prevention. This does not sit in front and stop ransomware. This sits behind saying, OK, if something gets through, I need to alert you immediately. Because it's all about time if your network goes down and if you get ransomware before it starts spreading to everything, that you need to stop it immediately. So what we do is we take backup snapshots of your network, every, as little as every five minutes, of all of your devices, anything we're set to backup. And what we have is those images and we store those. And every single backup, we're, we're comparing that backup image to the one right behind it. So we're able to see uh, a footprint of ransomware. When you get ransomware, the first thing that happens is it encrypts your files and changes the naming convention just like that. So we're able to see that and see bulk changes in the data saying, hey, something happened between the last two five-minute backup windows. Hold everything. Something's wrong. Then we alert our partners, alert Technologize saying, hey, there's something up with those last two backups, or last backup, go in there and find out, by the way, flip that switch, get them back up and running, and get them working virtually so that they can continue taking care of their clients, they can keep working, while in the background, we do in fi uh, indeed find out if it is ransomware, and then resolve it in the background. Sorry, you had a spider <laughs> yeah. <hanging> right <laughs> Really? <down>. I didn't <laughs> even see it, and I'm <laughs> absolutely terrified of spiders. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't just like, <laughs> if you can feel my heart right now, holy crap. <laughs> All right, so, so we're, we're analyzing each and every one of those backups in near real time. We do it as little as every five minutes, which is near real time enough. But And every single one of those backup images is a bootable image that if something happens, basically we just rewind the hands of time. If you get ransomware, let's just go back to five minutes ago. If there's a disaster, let's just go back to before that disaster. And I'll explain how we do that and, and how that works. 
So start rethinking about backup. I go so far as when I'm doing sales training, I, I, tell, I always told my sales engineers, don't even use the word backup because that's old and antiquated and there are better solutions out there. There are business continuity solutions that mean if you go down, let's just rewind the hands of time and get right back up and running. All right, so what is continuity and what is not continuity? It's always easier for me to explain what is not continuity first. Um, a cloud-only copy of your data. That is not business continuity. That's what San Francisco had. So it's great. You've got your data living on site, and you also have it living out somewhere else in a data center. But what happens when you need to access that data? You need to download it. You need your provider to put it on a, a drive and, and ship it to you. In that time, your network's down, and, and your employees can't work. Um, a local-only copy, obviously, if your data is just in your building, that's not business continuity because what if something does happen to your building? And I always point this out. If anybody's still using tape, and I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because there's usually a few in, in each room. If anybody's using tape backup, that technology was invented. Magnetic tape was invented in 1928. And people still use that to back up their critical business data, which, yes, it's, it's evolved since then, but that's just mind-boggling to me that people are still using tape compared to all the other solutions that we have. Um, and a file-based backup solution, meaning what that... Is, Magnetic tape, like real-to-real -real like magnetic a, tape. An external hard drive? Um, not so much an external hard drive, but a, a tape drive, like a cassette. Oh. Um, a different form oh, of a cassette oh, that, okay. yeah, that, that stores the data and stripes it to that. Got it. Um, and a file-based backup, meaning we're just backing up bits and pieces of your network. That's not business continuity because if you get somebody like me in there that thinks they know what they're doing and I create a new partition, a new folder somewhere, and I don't tell my IT department, and then I accidentally delete something and I call them saying, oh, well, I created a new partition yesterday and it's not there anymore and they didn't know about it. It was never set to be backed up. That is not business continuity. Um, so business continuity is, and I will warn you guys because I hate using uh, industry buzzwords and I'm, I'm about to, um, it's a hybrid cloud-based backup. That's just a fancy way of saying we keep multiple copies of your data. Our solution has a, a device on site, whether it's physical or virtual, and we store the, the, your data to that device, and then we send all of the data on that device to our data center that's out east, and then it gets replicated to our data center out west. That's business continuity. Uh, it's an image-based backup, meaning we're backing up everything, everything on that device, everything on your, your server, all the, the programs, the, the operating system, uh, your workstations, if we're backing up those, uh, the operating system, the, your files, your folders, your applications, um, your kids' pictures, uh, your music, your videos. We're saving all of that and we're storing that so that when you do need to virtualize, when you do come in, into a time where you need to access that from elsewhere, it's exactly how you're used to working. Same desktop background, same shortcuts, uh, same toolbars in your browser. Everything is exactly the same. And we deliver superior. Here's another industry buzzword warning, RTO and RPO. That's recovery time objective and recovery point objective. And I've got a great way of, of explaining that that I'll, I'll explain in a second. But basically, that's just making uh, dollars and cents out of downtime. How much does downtime cost my specific network? Um, and we eliminate downtime through virtualization. This is, this is the rub. This is what's, what's causing Datto to grow at the pace that we're growing. It's the ability to virtualize the data that we, we have. Um, so continuity, we all understand it, but how does it work? Um, instant virtualization, you're working. And for whatever reason, you can no longer work. You get hit by ransomware, fire, flood, tornado, and you lose access to your network. What we do is we go right to the data appliance and we spin up an exact same image of that server, of that workstation, whatever you happen to be working on, and we get you back up and running just like that. And we can do that in a matter of seconds. Um, the benefits of virtualization, uh, obviously it reduces downtime. If you go down, you're able to rewind the hands of time and, and just go right back. Uh, helps with your cost of going down, your RTO and RPO. And we can do this both from the local appliance or from our data center. So if you do have a hardware issue, if you do get ransomware, we'll just go to our appliance, spin it right back up. If you lose the whole building, we spin up your entire network from our data center, give you access to that. You can remain taking care of your clients while in the background, technologizes in there, rebuilding your network, finding out what happened, and, and replacing anything that needed to get replaced. So can you demonstrate it? Um, this is where my job gets actually really fun. and. Uh, and unfortunately, I will not be doing it today because I'm awfully gun shy. But we did develop a, a Datto disaster demo 
This is um, Ian McCord, our CEO's younger brother. Our CEO's only 31, a few years younger than me. Ian's even younger than that. I think he just turned like 26, which is just sickening considering that he's so high up in the company. But anyway, Ian said, if our, if our solution's that good, let's do it live in front of people. And so our, our first time that he did it, um, we were in, uh, uh, well, first let me back up. So what is a, a disaster demo? I'm giving this presentation. That's my, my laptop back there that I'm presenting from. A disaster demo, we bring that laptop down or that, that workstation down somehow. And then we go to our data appliance and we spin up an exact same image of that laptop from five minutes ago, do it live in front of you, and then continue with the presentation. That's a disaster demo. How we do the disasters, that's the fun part because we get awfully creative, especially I know what it's like sitting on that side and guys like me can be awfully boring. So we, we try to shake up the room, especially if, if you guys have ever been to like a, an industry event where there's hundreds of people and you, you got a full day of somebody like me going up there and presenting to you. It's boring, it's dry, and some of the presenters just suck the life out of the room. And then we go in there <laughs> and we get awfully creative with how we do a disaster demo. Um, this is, we like to light things on fire. Um, this is one of our partners actually doing it uh, at a, an event like this. Uh, this is me in Birmingham, Alabama, the very first time that I ever did it. Um, I, I put a little bit too much flash paper in, on my laptop. We, just, we physically destroy the laptops, and we donate two laptops for every one that we destroy. It, it is expensive, but, but we don't, we're not that wasteful. Um, in this case, I put a little bit too much flash paper inside of that laptop, and I burned all the hair off my arm. And, uh, and that poor guy right there had to smell that burning hair smell for the remainder of, of the presentation. It was, it was terrible. It was awful. Um, we don't always light things on fire. Sometimes we'll, we'll grab somebody in the room that looks like they're having a bad day and we'll just help, tell them to destroy it, like throw this on the ground and just beat it up. I've done it at uh, like driving ranges, had people do it with a golf club or baseball bat at a batting cage or ball game. Um, in this case, just because we are pyromaniacs, we lit it on fire anyway, right before we threw it. Um, we decided to do the opposite at, our, at one of our conferences a couple years ago. Again, this is Ian, and we decided to freeze our presentation in the middle of it. And we didn't practice this. We never practiced this. So we just went live. We had about 500 people in the room. And, uh, and I was just to the, to the left of him. And they're spinning hard drives in those solutions. And when you freeze a spinning hard drive, it starts wobbling and making all kinds of noises and moving. And, and I was genuinely terrified. And thankfully, this went off, off without a hitch. And we didn't have anything explode or anything like that. Um, so that was, that was awfully fun. Uh, we did have a partner in Iowa. People in Iowa are crazy. Anybody from Iowa? People in Iowa are nuts. They called me and they were like, hey, can, can we play with thermite? Has anybody ever played with thermite? <laughs> Chemical reaction between magnesium and aluminum? And I said, let me ask the lawyer first. But, um, so we, we had a lunch and learn just like this. And, uh, and we literally had to do it outside because it melted a hole through our, our device during the middle of the presentation. So we had, we had everybody turn around and look out to the field and say, all right, that's, that's what we're presenting from and watch it go down. Um, and, and yes, this is smoke and mirrors and, and it's showmanship and all that, but it gets people to remember it and people to say, okay, well, I get it now. If my network goes down, that's how fast they can bring it back up. Um, and I have two more that are, are the ones where we got in trouble. Uh, this is my boss in Sydney, Australia. Um, we went down there to, to open up our Sydney office and we told our engineer to go big. This is downtown Sydney, sold out Marriott, 600 rooms. Um, right on, on the, the harbor there, and, uh, and our engineer put entirely too much flash paper in there. And what we didn't know at the time is that in Australia, the, the smoke detectors are set way more sensitive than in the U.S. And sure enough, all the alarms started going off. They started evacuating all 600 rooms. Uh, the fire department did come, and for the rest of our presentation, we had four very large and upset firefighters with their arms crossed just shaking their head going, you stupid Americans, what are you doing in here lighting a fire? And, uh, and the joys of working for a millennial, we did have to call Austin, our CEO, in the middle of the night. We said, Austin, we got in trouble because you got to pay for that fire truck to come out. Uh, we got a $7,000 fine and we had to call him and say, hey, we got a $7,000 fine. And the first words out of his mouth were, was it cool? <laughs> and, and we're like, man, it was so awesome. The ball of, of fire was so big, and the, the firefighters were so pissed off at us. And, uh, and he told us, he said, just, we'll pay for it. Just don't do it again. 
So I stopped lighting fires. Um, I stopped doing that. I do have a video. I was in Calgary um, the end of, towards the end of last year. And an event like this, I, I had a room full of people. That's my engineer and, and uh, a member of the audience. And I said, we're streaming from this laptop. Let's drill a hole right through the laptop. But I'm not that bright. And I forgot to take out the battery. And when you drill a hole through a battery, that happens. And yeah. Hand it to Eric, he'll just run out of the restaurant. <laughs> so I, I don't do the disaster demos anymore. I, I, I'm going to let somebody else fight that battle and, and get in no trouble. Right now, just you. <laughs> in this case, the room wasn't much bigger than this, and that smelled terrible. And, and people actually left. They're like, I, I can't take it anymore. I'm, yeah, I, I, that's the last one I did where we actually destroyed something. Usually, I'll, I'll just do. Um, uh, like a, a, I'll simulate a disaster. I'll rip the guts out of a, a, a workstation as it's running and just blue screen it. Um, today, unfortunately, I will not. And I'm, when I walk in the room, I'm looking to see where the smoke detectors are because I'm, I'm absolutely paranoid. Um, but that is a disaster demo. If anybody is bored, we do record all of them, or we did when we used to do them. Um, disasterdemo.com, if anybody's ever bored, all of them are, are on there. We, we get pretty creative, and, and so do some of our partners. So. Total data protection, um, that is what, we, what our, our motto is. We want to protect your data no matter where it lives, uh, whether it's, it's physical on site, whether it's already in a data center. That data is valuable no matter where it's sitting, and we need to protect that no matter what. Um, stop thinking about backup. Start thinking business continuity. Now, let's take a step back. Um, I mentioned RTO and RPO, recovery time objective and recovery point objective. I am a very simple-minded person. If you want me to remember something, you got to draw it out. I got to see a picture of it. And that's, this is exactly what our marketing department put together for me. Um, you have your disaster. Doesn't matter what it is, uh, fire, flood, ransomware. For whatever reason, you lose access to your network. Your RPO, recovery point objective, is how far back in time are you willing to go? If your network goes down and you have to restore that data, how far back in time are you going to get that data? Meaning, how often are you currently backing it up? And how long are you willing to go back in time? How much more data can you recreate if you lose it? So there's a paper trail that some of you, uh, depending on what profession you're in, maybe you have a paper trail and you have to recreate that data and, and enter it again. Um, recovery time objective is how long you can go without your network. Um, how long can you lose access to your network before you start worrying about, OK, how am I going to take care of my clients? Um, there are tons of stats out there. The la last time I looked, and I don't mean to scare anybody with, with statistics, it was like 80, it was almost 90% of small businesses that lose their network for five consecutive days are out of business within 12 months. And I don't want to scare anybody, but that's a real number that, that we need to, to think about when it comes to our network and if we lose access to that data. So in keeping that in mind, what we did was we built a, an RTO, RPO calculator. What this is is, you can enter your data, you can enter your information based on your specific network, and this tool will help you calculate what downtime means for you down to the hour, and then you can adjust that to say, okay, if I lose access for four hours, what does that mean to me? If I lose access for a day, what does that mean to me? Um, the story behind this calculator is actually pretty fascinating, too. Um, we had uh, one of our brilliant um, engineers and developers, and we went to him and we said, hey, I need a tool where I can sit down with a business owner, calculate downtime. How can we make this happen? And the kid just nods his head. He's like, I got it, I got it. And he went down into his hole, and he was down there for three days later, and he plugged away, and he came out, and he had an 18-page Excel file that took three hours to fill out. And we're just like, I don't have three hours for a meeting. You need, you need to go back and start over. And he, when he came back out, he had it down in uh, less than 10 questions, which I think is, is absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to run through what, what that means and, and how to use this tool. Uh, step one is set your objectives for um, your quantities for your RTO and RPO. Again, how far back in time, based on time, how far back in time am I willing to go if I lose access? Meaning, OK, what am I restoring to, and how much data can I recreate? Is it a day? Is it a couple hours? Um, and then your recovery time objective is, OK, how, uh, how long can I be without that network? And think about your business, and realistically, OK, could I be down for 24 hours? Would I start freaking out if it was longer than that, less than that? Am I an accountant where if I'm down for two hours, I can't bill, I can't take care of my clients? What does that mean for me? Step two is about the network itself. 
Um, how much data is on that network? How often are we backing up that data? Um, what does your recovery process look like? In Milwaukee, where I'm from, I sold a lot into rural areas. So if I had a client that went down, it might be two hours before I could get an engineer on site to even look at it. And in that time, they're without their network. They can't work. So you have to account for that time. If you, if you are in a rural area or if you do have to call somebody to get them in, how fast can they be there? And then lastly, are you re uh, recovering from a local or a cloud copy? I will warn you, if you select cloud, the numbers skyrocket. Because if your data is living in a data center and you go down and you need to download that data, think of it like downloading a movie. If you need to download that data, it's going to take time. If you have a terabyte or two of data, you're going to have to call your provider, tell them to put it on a hard drive and ship it to you overnight at best, maybe two days that you're going to be down while they do this, while they, they transfer that data. This calculator takes into account the amount of data you have and the fastest transfer speeds that we have of getting that data from a device onto something else, onto your rebuilt network. And then step three is uh, about the business itself. Um, how many employees are affected? What's the average wage of those employees? Um, what's the average overhead cost of those employees per hour? I can tell you most people don't know that. And the easiest way to, to cheat that, it's roughly half your average wage. If your average wage is 30 bucks, set this to 15 and you're right in the, the same ballpark of average overhead. Um, and then a lot of people don't know this one either. What's the, the revenue generated per hour? Oftentimes it's, it's somebody in, in um, a services standpoint, uh, it's somebody that bills out a, a law firm, an accounting firm, where they know per hour what everybody's bringing in. You can account for that. If you don't know, simply leave it at zero. And then, and then these are all sliding scales. You can play with this and, and see what that, that truly means for you. Um, and then you hit calculate, and it calculates for your specific business, for your number of employees, the amount of data that you have, what downtime costs. And I can tell you, I've used this tool a ton of times when I'm talking about business continuity because the first thing somebody says is, well, that's, that's expensive. I, I, don't wanna, I, can't, I can't afford business continuity. We run through this exercise, and I say, okay, well, if you go down for one hour, we're already spending this much money. What if I provided you a solution that was roughly a, a cell phone plan a month to have complete business continuity for a network this small? It would be the, the cost of a cell phone a month to have business continuity where if you go down, we just flip a switch and bring it right back and get you taking care of your clients while we figure out why it went down in the background. That's what business continuity is. That's how you can use this tool to say, OK, well, what does downtime really cost me? Now let me evaluate my, my solutions, my options to say, all right, well, if I'm already spending this much money and this prevents it, that's money well spent. Total data protection. That's what Datto offers. Um, this is just a small piece of, of the solutions. Everything I described is our Cirrus solution. We have, we're constantly adding more solutions to our, our, um, our, our offerings. Um, I did mention backing up data that's already in a cloud. Uh, we did acquire, about two years ago, we acquired a company called Backupify, which is a, a backup for your SaaS applications, for your Google Apps, your Office 365. Um, I, was, I was still a partner at the time when, when this was, was happening. And the first thing I asked, I was like, well, if Microsoft and Amazon and Google promise me 99% uptime, why do I need a backup of that data? And the answer is simple. If, say, for example, you're on Office 365 on, on the standard plan, Microsoft only keeps that data for 30 days. Google Apps, they keep it for five. If you accidentally delete something and you don't know it till a week later, it's gone off of Google servers. If you have an employee that wipes out an email, deletes an email on accident, or Maybe they, they maliciously deleted uh, a calendar or something, and maybe they catch wind that they're about to get let go, and they delete everything. If you don't realize it till day 31, that data is gone for good. What this does is it offers a, a separate backup of it where you can go in and, and drag and drop and literally bring down an email, bring down a calendar, bring down uh, anything shit saved in your SharePoint. Um, that's it, our whole suite of products. I will be here after this presentation. If anybody wants to talk detail about any of this, I'm sure you guys don't. It's early in the morning. But if you do, I'm, I'm more than happy to chat. Um, the bulk of all of this is business continuity. Protect your data. There are solutions out there that, that are cheap, that are, uh, I shouldn't say cheap, that are, are less expensive than the normal people normally think about when it comes to business continuity and thinking, wow, that's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It's actually not. And it's, it's money well spent. 
So how are Technologize and Datto helping? Uh, we have this calculator. It's, it's absolutely free. Um, there is no cost. You don't need to pay for it. You don't need to buy anything. I would encourage every single one of you to, 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 to seek this out and, uh, and see what downtime truly costs you. All you have to do is... Hey, so, oh, Eric, I was going to say, as far as the calculator goes, uh, we do have it on our website. And uh, we will email a link to that for everybody so you can take a look at that. Very cool. Send an email to connect at technologize.com and they will be in touch with you um, to help walk you through that calculator, talk about the solutions, figure out uh, pain points when it comes to your network and, and what solutions they offer that can certainly assist and, and help out. And lastly, I end every presentation with my email address, et at datto.com. If anybody has any questions, if anybody wants this slide deck, if anybody wants anything from me at all, um, I create this stuff for you. So um, any questions, send me an email at et at datto.com. Um, I would give out my phone number, but I'm never at in front of a, a desk. Um, I'm on the road like three weeks out of the month. So email is definitely the, the easiest to get a hold of me. And again, it's connect at technologize.com. And with that, I just want to thank everybody for their time. So we've got a few. Thank you, uh, Eric. We appreciate you coming. We've yep. got a few. Uh, we've got a few questions, and uh, want to open it up to for you if you have any questions for us. But uh, here's an opportunity for you to kind of win a few prizes too, a few giveaways that we've Ooh. got. Um, but first, uh, before we get to that point, I wanted to ask uh, Dan and Christian to come up for a second. Um, because there's a few things that are important to me. I mean, Eric gave some pretty big examples of, you know, the hospitals, the San Francisco transit. Um, but my question is, uh, what kind of stuff do we see here locally? I mean, what's what's more relevant, I guess? I mean, because we see those big stories, but that's kind of far and away and, and not really here, right? Everybody thinks that, but yes, they're 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 everywhere. But what, but, what are but some local ones? Yeah, that? Me, I mean, without real specifics, just give me some general ideas of what we're seeing here. Well, I think maybe one of the the ones that definitely uh, applies to every everywhere, but especially here in our area, is um, they try to spread the ransomware that we just learned about by means of phishing. Anybody know what that means? Right, the phishing where where they send out emails pretending to be somebody they're not. Or maybe they'll send uh, an email saying, hey, I'm Joe, the CEO, uh, sending an email to the bookkeeper saying, hey, I need you to uh, open up this invoice and, and get these guys paid. Uh, and they've got ways of, of spoofing that. So it makes it, I mean, it makes it look very legitimate, makes it look very convincing. And as Eric brought out, I mean, most everybody's on social media. You've got pictures of yourself. You've got your emails. You've got your phone number. Some people have addresses. I mean, you put your pictures. If you download that picture, you can look at the details and see where it was taken, when it was taken, what time it was taken. I mean, it, it's all out there. We're and we are. So if you're out on yourself. vacation and you're posting on yep. Instagram, hey, I'm I'm over here in San Francisco. Somebody that's following you sees that. They say, hey, I, you know, just wrote a check for this uh, dental appliance in San Francisco. Can you send this guy a send this guy a check and there you go. Well, it's the same thing that applies with vacations. When you go out on vacation, you don't, you're not supposed to post on Facebook that you're on vacation, right? That leaves your house susceptible to robbery or anything else. So, um, and I think as we, as Eric alluded to earlier, uh, one of the biggest things is uh, making sure your employees are trained, making sure that people know not to click on those emails that Eric likes to click on. <laughs> well, <laughs> it becomes a real big problem if you don't know, uh, you know, because as, as he said, CEO said, cut this check. So cut the check, right? You're supposed to do your job, get it done quickly, and... Uh... So another another example, too. We taught, I mean, the Equifax has been in the news about the breach that they had there. So tell me a little bit what... Uh, summarize, what caught, wh where was the breach, and, and could it have been prevented? It could have been prevented. And, uh, you know, the Equifax breach was mostly um, related to um, Apache... Uh, which is a web server, um, a known exploit from several months before the breach even occurred. There was a patch, I think, two or three months beforehand that Equifax overlooked or didn't apply, and uh, which is what people gained access from. And, I mean, it's affected a lot of people. I mean, probably people in this room even. Um, have I was on the list. I'm yep. on the list. Yep. So, so essentially, so just, Dan, to summarize, so there, there was one server that did not have its security patches with a known vulnerability that had been there for quite some time. Yep. And most servers. Uh, and what's, sorry, and, and so what do we, I mean, just 
just out and about in general in the community, what would you say is the a guesstimate percentage on how many organizations don't have all their patches done? I don't even want to guess. I, uh, yeah, it, it's a <laughs> 75% plus probably. Okay, the number, the reason for it is, you know, you you apply patches, say you have seven servers in your infrastructure or even workstations, and it doesn't have to be just servers, it doesn't have to be just workstations. When, you're, uh, when you don't have a set patching cycle, one workstation is off, doesn't get patched, it's now, a vulnerabil uh, it's now vulnerable. Things like WannaCry, the worms, the WannaCry spread and everything else. Windows updates more or less stopped a lot of it. It would have stopped it from being a problem for most workstations with just Windows updates that run you know, every first Tuesday of the month. It's a big issue. Yeah, and I wanna maybe touch on a, a little bit more on what, oh, I'm sorry. I just said if we, you're using technologize, do we need to worry about those updates or are you doing that for us or do we have to do it? <laughs> we do it. You do it. <laughs> we, we take care of that. <laughs> but it is, it's, and you, yeah. <laughs> they, It, it is a lot of it does come to the to the basic housekeeping, you know, with with security and infrastructure and, and, and patching. It's amazing how many organizations don't have that in place. Uh, and and as we know, with Equifax and other examples, all it takes is one a piece of a machinery, one device, and then it opens up the whole organization. Uh, what I mean. I want to open it up too. Who's got anybody have any specific questions or anything that they're dying to know? Yeah. So I hear you and a lot of people talk about these um, emails that get sent and then you click on it, like Eric, and um, and then something gets deposited on your computer. And I I don't know whether. This clicking on the, 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 the link is the last thing you have to do, or once you get there, is there something else that you have to do? Because I, I have my operating system set to the highest security, which means that if I do anything that requires elevated uh, permissions, it asks me. Uh, it, and, 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 and I kind of would hope, but on the other hand, I know that you don't need elevated permissions to delete files and stuff, so. I guess if I understand the question, uh, you know, what, where's the, you know, where's it actually, the exploit actually uh, execute? Yes, is there something else that... It's, it depends, it, it really depends on the variant and the, and the, and the exploit and the virus and, and basically there's, there's a lot of different flavors and how they function and work. Uh, okay, so let me, let me rephrase the question then. Can you get infected simply by clicking on something if your operating system is set to the highest uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it depends on the con on the context. So everything is going to run. If you click on it, right? You click on this link. It downloads an application. Uh, it's going to run in your logged in users context. Okay. Now you say you couldn't uh, if you don't have administrative permissions or if you have UAC enabled uh, yes. with those permissions, you won't be able to encrypt. You know the other profiles on your computer. Say Joe logs into your computer. You know uh, on Mondays, you won't be able to encrypt his but you, it would encrypt your profile just the same okay. because it's going to run in your permissions. It doesn't need advanced permissions in order to, uh, in order to just encrypt or delete files. And to, to add to that, there are also exploits that whose whole purpose is simply what's known as privilege escalation. So even yeah. in cases like that, yeah, it might only get to your stuff until it figures out, hey, I don't have access to all this stuff. Let me go jump over there as well. So just don't click on it. <laughs> We, we get them all the time uh, at Datto. Everybody's, everybody's trying to attack us. And <laughs> basically, before we click on any link, now we, we hover over it and just see where that's directing us to. Um, because oftentimes, it's, it's not where you think it's going to go. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, Gary. I have a quick question. With, with this vulnerability that we're talking about as far as the links, is there anywhere that you suggest businesses use as uh, training? For employees, oh, that's a great question. What do I? I tell them don't click, <laughs> but you know, everybody sends us things every day that you have to open, mm -hmm. and so you know, our, we got hit, you know, when uh, we had an employee that was that quit, and her her last day, you know, she's trying to clean out her email, 
And, you know, coincidence? I don't think so. She didn't do it on purpose. But she's mm-hmm. trying to get everything cleared out of her inbox. that probably been sitting there for two years. You know, as far as a single source there for edu- educating employees and stuff like that, I mean, we uh, are making more efforts uh, to do that uh, with, with Technologize, putting stuff on our website, uh, partner information, putting that on our website. Uh, you know, you can always reach out to us, and we can always provide something and, and help out with that. But as far as a source online or something like that, uh, even just uh, well, search ransomware and just don't. <laughs> so, do I want the training or do I want to get the infection? Uh, there are, and, and I'll share with you guys, there are services, too, that we could talk about after this that, that your, your clients can definitely take advantage of. Yeah, there's some things that we can provide, but I think it's something that we'd have to send you and email you and let you know yeah, what avenues to take. a great tool that we could all, all use for, oh. for training. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll send out a follow-up email with some tips on that. Okay. The, the best... With a link to click on. Just don't put a link in it. The, the best the, you could no, you could have. <laughs> so you, we we do that too. One of the things that that I'll do at an industry show is I'll have um, I'll I'll bring somebody with me that hands out USB sticks, and then I'll I'll mimic as I'm up there on stage getting ransomware, and it's all fake. It's all a video. But I'm like, where did this USB stick come from? And everybody's pointing to the girl in the back of the room, and she, every single person has it in their hand. They're like, holy crap, this is ransomware? <laughs> no, it's all, it's all fake. Um, <laughs> but it's there to prove uh, Yeah, you know, just prove to point, prove, because prove it, because a point. Because it does. I mean, that does happen, and we have seen that. Yeah. In, you could have the, the best training and the, the, the best security in place, but um, I don't know how many times I walk into somebody's office and I see their password on a Post-it note on their monitor. Like, or under their keyboard, like nobody's gonna look there. So yeah, yeah. save the w- Excel sheet. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading the other. I was reading the uh, other day that really two thirds are all. Uh, ba- I mean, two thirds of infections obviously are, are because of imp- uh, the human factor, mm-hmm. people. You know, so that is a good point, and that is a biggest battle is is educating yeah. everybody on what not to do and what to do because. Because you can have all the security in the world and things in place, and if somebody clicks on something, it can just, it can circumvent everything. Mm-hmm. There's Bjorn, that. Oh. Bjorn had a question. Yeah, Eric, you mentioned the restoration was a virtual machine. Does that mean that the machines, the computers that you are providing the service, are those all virtual as well? Then, as far as what you're you're working on, if you do go down, it is a a virtual instance, whether it's on our appliance or in our data center. Um, and then Technologize would come in and, and replace that workstation. And then what we're doing while you're virtualized is we're still taking backups. So all we do is take that last one and put it, set it right on top of your, your brand new workstation or rebuilt server and bring it right back. Okay, so until the repair is made, I'm running a virtual copy of what I previously had that did not have to be a virtual machine. Right. Yeah, yeah all of that's included. Any other questions? Because I've got, okay, so I've got a couple for you. So anybody uh, remember what RTO stands for? Okay, wait, wait, wait it's got, sorry, I, hands. Who's the first one? I've got a couple. So here, I've got a couple favorite shirts. One right here. It's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> So who who had the fr- who answered that first? I, I just heard some. Over here. Uh, no. Jeb, was that you or oh Walter? There you go. <laughs> All right, good. So what about uh, anybody notice how many peta- petabytes was stored in the Datto data center? Oh, I didn't even mention it. Did did? No. One dollar, Bob. One dollar, Bob. <laughs> no, somebody somebody said it. Now who said it? What was it? What? How much did you say? <laughs> 345? He said 325. 325, yeah. Oh, is it? Sorry, it was 325. Yeah, he said 320. You want a t-shirt? <laughs> Eric, I'll get you something. Yeah, all right, all right. So this one, uh, do, ma- do not blame me. It's a hardware problem. So there you go. But does anybody uh, know what 325 petabytes really is? I don't. Um, and when I started, it was the number was much lower. It was under, under it was right around 200. 
So I'd, I'm a music guy, and, and I'd, I try to figure out what 200 petabytes of data really is. If you play iTunes, if you hit start on iTunes and plays every single song in iTunes, it wouldn't repeat a song for like, it was like 400 years. Like that's how much data, and, and we've doubled that since then. So that, that's a testament to our partners like Technologize, and more importantly, you all that, that trust them to, to store that data and protect that data, and then they in turn trust data. Okay, so uh, one more question. Uh, what currency does, does uh, do the... Bitcoin. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Bitcoin, all right. Does anybody have any Bitcoin? I was at an event not long ago, and it was uh, for accountants. And the guy before me actually had a whole presentation about how you need to set up a Bitcoin account and just wait for somebody to attack you. And I'm, I go up there, and I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a Bitcoin account, but that's just so I can track it and look, and it's more of a hobby than anything. But So, so this is kind of not peripherally related, but why did that... Since you mentioned it, why did the uh, price of a Bitcoin go up uh, after that? It, it fluctuates. It's, it's Think of it like a, any kind of stock. It, well, it, it's supply and demand. Yeah. It, it, no, but, 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 but you tied it specifically to an attack as if the attackers knew that by doing the attack, they would increase. They, they knew that the global response would be, holy cow, look what these bad guys did, and overnight. It'd, it'd be like watching the stock market, and something major happens in the stock market, Prices go up and down. It's, it's the same same exact principle. Well, Something bad happened out there in the world and shot the value right up. It's also, it's also how <laughs> Bitcoin works, how cryptocurrency works. Uh, they started. They have separate phases. So in the beginning, when Bitcoin was really inexpensive, it was mined. You know, people with many many GPUs and a setup mined Bitcoin. So they did computations yeah. to get Bitcoins. Yeah. What Once, uh, graphics cards. So the, uh, once that phase was completed, Bitcoin then started gaining in value and people started trading it. So it was around the same, it's kind of the same concept where you can no longer, just like the United States dollar, there is no more Bitcoin available. It's all out there, like 98% of it or something is already out there. There's no more that can really be mined. So now it's now supply and demand. They knew that the, the demand would go up because people need to buy Bitcoin in order to pay these ransoms. So the, obviously, as it's going to see that, Bitcoin price is going to go up, 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 because the supply is already really small, and the demand is really high. They knew they'd manipulate the market. We're at our uh, time here. So again, thank you very much, everybody, for showing up today. Appreciate your attendance. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to us. Uh, again, at connect at technologize.com. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>